Welcome to uh, my second lecture of my course, uh, World History. And in this case, it will be our second lecture. The topic is transatlantic slave trade. And uh, this topic is actually connected directly to what we discussed last time. And in this case, let me uh, take you to a few slides, which we saw last time. Okay. <clears throat> Remember, we discussed last time uh, how the Portuguese jump-started their own empire, how the Spaniards became jealous to what the Portuguese achieved in the Indian Ocean, and that the major drive for Europeans to go overseas was to find the access to their oriental riches so-called oriental riches it's uh, spices they needed uh, in uh, from india china indonesia the spice areas uh, muslim middlemen muslim merchants controlled the sources of spices and europeans could not go there could not reach these oriental areas by surface so they had to go by sea okay and spices were, as I said, very important for the Europeans. It was um, <clears throat> a very valuable item, okay? Not everybody had them. Plus, to have a lot of spices meant that you would be able to preserve your food because, again, there was um, hardly any ice. Refrigeration was not known in Europe at that time. So, uh, pepper was used, for instance, to preserve meat, okay? and ginger cinnamon were also used in cooking and plus uh, some exotic spices were also an item that uh, some uh, rich people could afford so it was a status symbol status symbol so spices were very much craved um, object europeans wanted okay that was the major drive okay the second thing which um, we don't know too much yet about because we're going to discuss this next week it's a uh, religious wars in europe reformation when europeans became divided into um, two areas uh, northern part of europe became protestant southern part of europe still remained roman catholic as you know that before 1517 all europe was roman catholic everybody was catholic but then northern europe split away martin luther took away uh, part of europeans from the catholic church and they became protestants okay so the ancestors of present-day baptists methodists presbyterians you name them bunch of protestant denominations so these people um, went away from the roman catholic church that is why Roman Catholics were very much interested in expanding overseas to what? To find new people to convert to Catholic Church. So that is why uh, Portugal and Spain, which remained uh, die-hard Catholic countries, they had the second goal, you know, to go overseas to convert new people, to bring, to bring them to the Catholic Church. But again, this is the secondary thing. The first and major thing was economic, to find the source of spices. So Portuguese go there, they find out uh, the Indian market, they seize the Indian markets in spice trade, and that was it. Spaniards became jealous, and that's when Christopher Columbus stepped in, who offered to the Spanish king and queen his project of going westward, okay, to locate what the source of spices uh, through the short card, because nobody knew that the new world the americas was there but again in the process of his uh, journey 1592 he discovers um, uh, caribbean islands a few caribbean islands okay hispaniola cuba uh, <clears throat> and he was followed by conquistadors who wanted to seize all these areas and especially to f since they couldn't find spices there uh, to get gold because they heard the rumors of gold and two Indian kingdoms were conquered. We mentioned these kingdoms, uh, the Aztec kingdom in Mexico and the Inca kingdom in uh, Peru. Um, but look at this slide. 
look at the slide and that's where um, I told you I would stop. I didn't stop there last time. I simply told you that I would bring back the slide just to make a point. See, Spaniards who seized and Portuguese who seized all these areas in Latin America, they wanted to turn them in their encomienda domain. So encomienda, it was like feudalism, like system that had existed in Middle Ages. So they wanted to become landlords and they wanted to make Indians into peasants, like serfs, to work on the latifundia, the big land estates. Spanish conquistadors were granted big land estates called latifundia and they expected Indians to work there or mines. There were gold and silver mines that had been given to conquistadors and they also expected Indians to work to work at these mines. Okay. Um, so they thought about Indians as serfs. Remember I told you last time who these people were serfs. That's how it was in pre-modern times, before the 1500s. All over the world, people were divided into basically four groups of people. Either aristocrats or clergy, church people, serfs, people who were bound to land. They were personally free. They couldn't be sold separate from the land, but they were bound to land and they could be sold with land. And slaves who belonged to particular... Uh, aristocrats, lords, and uh, who could be sold, okay? So, uh, Spaniards wanted to use Indians as serfs, as serf labor, but there was a problem. So, look at this last bullet point on my slide. The epidemics were killing Indians, okay? Again, there might be a... I like to ask this question on my quiz, on my first quiz, to ask this question from my students. What was the major killer of the Indians? Okay, American Indians. And sometimes they answer, oh, European guns and things like that. No, the major killer was uh, epidemics because Indians did not have immunity for European diseases and um, they died. 90% of them died before they developed immunity. Okay, for different sorts of uh, European diseases. Again, remember we told about this epidemic diseases, how Europeans in um, Middle Ages, in the 1300s, they themselves had become the victims of uh, an epidemic disease. It was bub bubonic plague that had been brought by Mongols and how up to 60% of Europeans died from this disease. Okay. So now it was Indians who even had less immunity because they were totally isolated from the old world. So now it was Indians, unfortunately, who had to suffer from this. Again, sometimes some historians, um, uh, radical historians, they say, oh, Europeans purposely infected the Indians with these diseases. So as a person who studied this, issue studied this question so i want to tell you that it was um, basically diseases were brought by the europeans you know not nobody has tried to spread them on purpose okay your diseases were brought from europe because europeans were were having these diseases okay and in fact there were some indians american indians in many parts of north america and south america who had never seen uh, Europeans, but they already died from diseases because they contracted epidemic diseases from uh, neighboring Indians. And that's what happened, for example, with the Inca kingdom in Peru that had been conquered in 1536 by Francisco Pizarro. Uh, one of the reasons he succeeded so much is that even before he reached the Inca kingdom. So many residents of the Inca kingdom, they had died from epidemic diseases. Again, Indians were not exposed before to such common diseases like tuberculosis, measles, plague, of course, flu. Okay, And so now they died. And of course, it greatly demoralized them, greatly demoralized them. Um, so that is why uh, Spaniards and the Portuguese, they couldn't use the Indians as a serf labor or slave labor. Uh, 
there were hardly any of them left. Caribbean islands, for instance, were didn't have any Indians by the early 1600s. All Indians died over there, okay, because of epidemic diseases. In parts of northern Brazil, the same thing, okay, same thing happened. Um, plus, there was also another problem. By uh, the 1600s, gold and silver in Latin American mines had been extracted. Okay, so remember the Spanish Empire became very rich. They made a lot of money, but at the same time, uh, the old gold was extracted. And plus, Spain, Spanish Empire used all the all its gold to buy things, and they soon wasted all this gold, and the gold ended up in the pockets of uh, the Dutch and English merchants. Okay, so the mines were uh, depleted. Plus, there was hardly any Native American labor available, not as much as they wanted. And on top of this, in those areas where all Indians died, the Caribbean islands, parts of Central America and uh, coastal parts of Brazil, Europeans suddenly discovered that um, they could plant a profitable crop sugar sugar cane and the sugar cane by the way came to replace whatever spaniards had before gold and silver so when gold and silver were extracted europeans found that money could be made now by planting sugar cane again introduction of sugar claim, uh, cane um, it was a slow process it was at first cultivated in uh, coastal cities um, in Portuguese coastal cities. So the Portuguese, they seized a few islands um, that were between Portugal and Africa, and they um, introduced their sugar cane. The sugar cane, by the way, was had been brought from Eastern Mediterranean area, okay, from Ottoman Empire, slowly. But eventually, uh, Europeans started to plant it in southern France, okay, in parts of Italy, on a small basis, but eventually they found out that in a tropical climate, the sugar cane was growing like crazy. So on a few islands off the Portuguese coast and off African coast, they uh, created plantations, plantations where they planted the uh, sugar cane. And gradually, a uh, sugar cane um, crossed the Atlantic, crossed the Atlantic and uh, started to spread around the northern Brazil and Caribbean islands. And that's how local Europeans, at first it was Port the Portuguese and Spaniards, and then English and the Dutch, who in many respects came to replace uh, the Spaniards and the Portuguese. Remember why? Because uh, the British and the Dutch, they were more enterprising people. They were more aggressive, aggressive in uh, terms of money making. They were shrewd business people. Okay. Um, and they squeezed eventually the Portuguese and Spaniards, okay, from Caribbean, Caribbean islands, uh, <clears throat> parts of northern Brazil. But anyway, so these Europeans, the Spaniards, Portuguese, uh, the Dutch, the English, they realized, they realized that a lot of money could be made by growing sugarcane that gr grew so well in uh, the tropical islands of Central America and uh, northern part of Latin America, like um, Brazil, Colombia, okay. So th that is why there was a problem. They needed labor, but the labor was missing. There was no labor. American Indians were not there, okay. Um, so they decided to switch to something else, okay. They decided to use the established trade networks that were established by the 1600s, trade networks between the old, wor old world and uh, new world to bring slaves from the old world, okay? Since the Native American labor was not available, they decided to bring slaves from the old world. And this part of the old world, jumping ahead, it was Western Africa, okay? But before, let me say, 
a few words about this um, network trade um, network that was created in the Atlantic Ocean. Okay, to describe what was going on, we use this expression Columbian Exchange. Remember, I told you last time that uh, this expression Columbian Exchange uh, historians used to describe uh, the exchange, this historical exchange between two parts of the world, the New World, Europe and Africa, and the New uh, Old World, Europe, Europe and Africa, New World, North America and South America. So we have Europeans items coming to America and uh, American Indian items slowly coming to Europe. Okay. So here is the map, how it looked. Okay. Just to give you a uh, basic idea how this trade exchange was done. Raw materials were coming from uh, raw materials were coming from uh, the New World. Uh, Europe accepted these raw materials. They produced manufactured goods like guns, utensils, everything, jewelry, and delivered it to. Uh, Africa to the Africans. In exchange, Europeans received slaves. Local African kings offered them prisoners of war, slaves in exchange for European manufactured goods. In fact, this map, um, I will show you a different map, which is more exact. It doesn't exactly correct the situation. In fact, I'm going to criticize this map because that is the misconception. This map made by some uh, historian and it was published in Encyclopedia Britannica. It's not a good, it's not an exact map. Why? Because it shows that uh, slaves, slaves, see, coming from uh, Western Africa to North America. Absolutely wrong. Because the major, uh, the major slave routes were directed here. It's Caribbean island, Central America, and North America, right here. So not here. Here is just a 10% of slaves were coming to North America. The 90% of slaves were delivered here. Okay. So I'm using this map to make a point. And I'm going back to this again because uh, I want to repeat this because we have this uh, misconception since we talk a lot about slavery. We live in the United States and some students or some people might make this mistaken impression that all, all slaves were delivered from West Africa to North America or the United States. Absolutely wrong. So 90% of slaves were delivered here. Okay, so be careful looking at this map. Um, so here, this slide, just to alert you what I, uh, I have spelled out a few minutes ago that the Spain extracted gold and silver from the New World by the 1600s. So uh, there was no labor. So how to use all these lands? And suddenly they discovered, they and other Europeans discovered that sugar cane could, be, could bring a lot of money. Okay. So and everybody decided to gamble on, uh, on the slave trade. Okay. To bring new slave labor. Why do you, um, why do you, you might want to ask me, so why was it Western Africa? Okay, when we have a face-to-face -face class, I usually uh, ask my students the same question, okay? As you find out in this lecture that um, in Europe, the major source of slaves actually was Eastern Europe in Eastern Europe. And in fact, uh, this expression Slavic people, you heard about Slavic people, Slavs, Eastern Europeans, it uh, originated from this uh, uh, practice of capturing slaves in Eastern Europe, where originally Vikings uh, went to capture people and s uh, sell them in slavery. Okay. And later, a lot of Slavic uh, people were sold through Crimean Peninsula. I'm going to mention it again. Okay. But uh, European slaves were not 
picked up to be delivered into the new world, especially tropical islands? The answer is very simple. Europeans could not be brought to the tropical islands because they had, in, they had no immunity for tropical diseases, see? When we talked about the diseases, so Indians who lived in tropical areas who had no immunity for European diseases, they died, okay? But those Europeans who came to live in, in tropical areas of Central America or northern part of uh, South America, they equally died because they had no immunity for tropical diseases, okay? The average life expectancy for a European who decided to stay uh, in tropical, die-hard tropical areas was three, four months. Rarely people survived, so that is why some Europeans tried to just come there and quickly leave, okay? It was only a few areas that in like Cuba, in Hispaniola that uh, did not have these um, forest areas. So that's where Europeans could land and stay for a few days or build some kind of a fort. But they couldn't go inland. What, uh, sometimes uh, students uh, or people in general are wondering why Africa had been, uh, hadn't been colonized in the 1500s, 1600s or 1700s for that matter. Whereas the New World and different parts of uh, the globe were colonized. The answer is very simple, because Europeans had no immunity for tropical diseases. They easily could become sick with yellow fever. And it was only at the end of the 19th century, particularly 1870s, 1880s, when the kinine was invented. That's a medicine that could alleviate to some extent the yellow fever. Okay. And only after this, Europeans decided to colonize Africa. So it hadn't been done before because they had no medicine for yellow fever, for other tropical diseases. Okay. <clears throat> but the Africans who lived in West Africa, they did have immunity already for the tropical diseases. Okay. Plus, uh, the distance, the distance between West Africa and um, the New World, Brazil particularly, was very short, like two week travel. That's the famous, um, that's the famous um, narrow passage, narrow passage, okay. Let me show you this map. So look at this. So see, this part of Western Africa was chosen Europeans to get slaves and to bring them here, 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 and here. So that is why use this map. This map is much better. It describes better the major slave routes. See, these brown arrows, they show you the slave routes from uh, Africa to the New World. And this is the most, this is the see, narrow passage from here to here, two week, two week travel. <clears throat> or you can, uh, you can look at this map, if uh, a more schematic map, okay, it's a more crude, but essentially describes the same, the same thing. Okay. It's, it's very hard to pick up the date and say, hey, that's when it started. So roughly it started about 1518, this uh, transatlantic slave trade. And it was controlled uh, at first by um, the Portuguese and Spaniards. Okay. Slaves were supplied by local African kings and chiefs. In fact, a lot of Africans, uh, local African kings, there were such states called Gold Coast, Slave Coast, Dahomey, Dahomey. They actually rose in power by doing the slave trade. So they brought, they captured prisoners of war in, from inland parts of Africa, brought them to coastal areas and sold them to the Europeans. In fact, uh, 
um, Europeans were afraid, as I said, to um, go in inland areas of Africa. So Europeans did not capture these people. Okay, they didn't come and into to penetrate inland areas. They purchased slaves from African kings and uh, chiefs who offered slaves to the Europeans. Okay, again, I also want to emphasize this point just to make sure that we know how it was done. And sometimes a question asked: How could uh, these um, African um, kings, local in Western Africa, from such kingdoms like Dahomey, Slave Coast, Gold Coast, how could they sell their own, the black people? The problem is that they didn't think about themselves as, as the same people. Okay, they didn't think about uh, people whom they captured as Africans. There was no such concept, Africans. Africans, it's an a European concept. You know, they introduced this to generalize uh, people, you know, to kind of pigeonhole people who lived in Africa. So those people who lived in Africa, uh, they didn't think this way, you know. And by the way, and even right now, if you go to Africa and some parts of Africa, you will see that for them, um, it's more important ethnic tribal difference than thinking about themselves as African together, okay? Especially at that time. So there was no concept. They didn't know that so this particular area, the continent they lived in, because people were not aware of the continent, okay? They had no maps. And the plus, I repeat, they viewed the African kings in coastal areas of West Africa, they viewed other Africans in inland areas as their enemies or the source of slaves. So they captured them, they organized um, uh, expeditions, expeditions in inland areas of um, Africa and captured people, okay? So here you can see um, that uh, the point I'm trying to make, that coastal African states controlled the slave trade, okay? They captured these people. <clears throat> In fact, um, I would like to say that there was a, a vibrant sla slave trade in Africa already, so uh, slavery was had been practiced in uh, Africa for ages. In fact, you have to be aware that slavery was everywhere in the world. Before the 1900s, before the 1900s, all over the world, slavery was practiced, all over the world, okay? It was only in uh, such countries as England, Netherlands, France, for the first time in human history, people started to question this institution and eventually they made steps to eliminate the institution of slavery. I repeat, such European countries as um, England, France, Netherlands, these were the first countries to question the institution of slavery and eventually to eliminate the institution of slavery. Some Christian uh, theologians, uh, Christian politicians who said that it was against God, against the Bible, and uh, things like that, okay. But um, going back to Africa, so before Europeans uh, reached this uh, coastal parts of Africa, the Africans had been involved in the slave trade. So they actually sold captured prisoners of war to Arabs in the Mediterranean, so the slave market, okay, slave market. Gold, slaves, salt, that was the, ma the three major items of exchange between these two parts of the world, okay? <clears throat> and I will be talking more about it to emphasize, because I don't want you to, um, even though our lecture is called Transatlantic Slave Trade, why? Because we are talking about this um, um, discovery of the New World, Columbus, and what happened. Um, and how transatlantic slave trade originated from this uh, invasion of uh, the New World. But still, we have to be aware about the whole context. It wasn't something peculiar that had happened in this particular area. So I repeat, um, Africans enslaved each other for thousands of years. What, happened, what did happen, that when Europeans came, at first Portuguese, then Spaniards, they rerouted, they rerouted this trade from here to here. So that's what happened. So they incentivized local African kings by bringing them some European items, guns, cannons, whatever, 
European utensils and by receiving slaves in exchange. So they in incentivized local African kings who started to organize more expeditions to inland areas. And that's how, by the way, the whole areas of uh, Western Africa were completely depleted, depopulated, depopulated. Okay. So-called the Middle Passage was the major uh, route chosen by Europeans to deliver slaves from Western Africa to the Americans. Why? I repeat again, because it was the most uh, this narrow passage, the quickest route, two weeks. Okay. <clears throat> and of course, the, the death rate was uh, very high on these journeys from the crowded condition. From this horrendous clouded condition now some statistics for you which we need to remember you may want to know how many people total had uh, had been brought from western africa to different parts of americas historians believe that uh, between 10 and 12 million people of african descent uh, <clears throat> ancestry were transported across the Atlantic from the 1500s to the 1880s. Again, look at the date, 1880s. That's another interesting point I want to make because sometimes by uh, living here in the United States, we talk tons of books and movies about civil war, emancipation proclamation, just uh, everywhere, like from on each corner, you know, historians talk about it. And sometimes we might have this mistaken impression that slavery was over when, when Lincoln spelled out his uh, Emancipation Proclamation, 1863. Okay, it's only in the United States. I would like to alert you that in many parts of the world, slavery still survived. In, in uh, Brazil, for instance, slavery survived until 1883. Only in 1883. In Cuba, until 18, 1885. Okay. In many parts of Africa, by the way, slavery survived well in the 20th century. Okay. In Mauritania, Mauritania, it's a Western African country. Do you know when slavery was abolished in Mauritania? Mauritania, it's an African country in West Africa. 1980. In um, Yemen, it's... Uh, Arabian Peninsula. Slavery was abolished in 1960. 60, 1960. In Sudan, in parts of Sudan, slavery is still practiced to the present day. Sudan, it's a country that is torn apart by a civil war in Africa. Okay, it's a eastern part of Africa. Slavery is still practiced in parts of Sudan to the present day, can you imagine? So anyway, um, historians believe that um, in addition to these um, 12 million people, I so let me choose these 12 million um, people uh, number of slaves that had been shipped from West Africa to uh, Americas. That's the actual uh, number that had been provided by a popular historian called, his name is Philip Kurtzen. C starts with C. C U R T. I, and I should have written his name, but uh, I didn't. Philip Kurtzen in his book published in 1969, he gives us this number, 12 million people. So in addition to these 12 million people, uh, historians argue that 2 million people died during this middle passage route, which is what, 10, 15 percent. Okay. <clears throat> now, another important chart see remember i twice i told you about destinations the major destinations of slave routes see the major bulk of slaves went to caribbean islands and brazil tropical islands and tropical areas which cultivated sugar there were sugar plantations okay latin america eh, not exactly a good expression it's like mexico peru uh, Colombia, Argentina, Chile, 
and finally the British North America, it's New England or southern states like Virginia, uh, Carolinas, uh, New York State, Pennsylvania. So all these areas, they observed only 10%. So the major 80% of slaves or 90% of slaves went to Latin America. Latin America, primarily Brazil and Caribbean, and only 10% to North America. How, um, how did they use slaves here in North America? Here, it wasn't, of course, sugar. It was um, uh, the major goal of bringing slaves here was to force them to work at tobacco plantations. So before so-called cotton king, cotton plantations had been introduced widely in the 1700s. We have a practice, different practice. Again, cotton in 1600s was not grown. Hardly, was hardly grown in the uh, southern part of uh, North America. It was mostly what? Tobacco crops and rice crops. That's what slaves worked on. They worked in, on rice and tobacco plantations. So that was the major goal of the slave tra traders to deliver them to be uh, used, exploited at this... Uh, tobacco and rice plantation, okay. <clears throat> All slaves, when they came from West Africa to um, South America, or a few of them to North America, um, they were forced to go through called seasoning. Seasoning, it's this brutal practice where they were trained or intimidated into slavery. So they were uh, trained to become slaves. Okay, it's like a, a brutal uh, the boot camp, brutal work campaign. Okay, four or five months in Caribbean islands, mostly in Caribbean islands, this newly arrived uh, slaves, they were forced to go through the seasoning. So the slave boot camp, let me put it this way. Again, we talked about why Africans, we answered this question, right? It's because uh, Africans lived in a tropical climate, they developed immunity, okay. So now, now another very important thing. Again, I told you earlier in this lecture that uh, please do not have this mistaken uh, impression that um, Slavery, it was something that had been done by the African kings and Europeans in the Atlantic Ocean, transatlantic slave trade. Yes, it was a very big and important um, area that was involved in slave trade, Atlantic Ocean. But no less important was this area. African slave trade that was controlled by the Arabs, or conducted by Arabs and by some local African kings who lived here in coastal areas of uh, eastern part of Africa, which is today Tanzania, Somalia, okay? So Arabs were purchasing slaves, millions of slaves, millions of slaves, delivering them to Saudi Arabia, to the Middle East, all local African kings selling slaves from Sudan to Egypt, okay? So a huge... Area was involved in slave trade. Indian princes also were purchasing slaves. So that is why I would like to balance this picture of transatlantic slave trade by telling, by sharing you with this stuff, you know. If you look careful at the dates, you will see that long after European nations abolished the slave trade and slavery, Arabic countries still maintain, still practice slave trade until 1900s and even beyond 1900s in such countries like Yemen, where I said slavery was abolished in 1960. Can you imagine? 1960. In Sudan, it's right here. It's still to the present day. We have chunks of Sudan where people sell people. Hard to imagine, but that's what how they live, unfortunately. <clears throat> So here we have uh, approximately the same number of Africans sold into slavery. 10 million Africans were sold by the Arabs into slavery. And in fact, the slave trade started early in 1200s. See, 
1200s before transatlantic slave trade and ended uh, slowly i repeat not right away in 1950s 1960s okay sometimes arabs uh, organized expeditions to capture people or uh, most frequently they did what europeans uh, done uh, did later you know in west africa they came and purchased uh, slaves from local uh, african kings or some mixed blood kings because i forgot to tell you that people who were in charge of the slave trade both in western africa and eastern africa they were mixed blood people okay in uh, eastern africa here um, uh, they were called so-called swahili swahili people who spoke swahili language Swahili people, many of them were a mixture of uh, Arabs and Africans. So these Swahili um, princes controlled the trade, slave trade. Okay, And the same thing was in the western part of Africa, where uh, mixed um, uh, the offspring of white and uh, Africans controlled the slave trade. Or local African kings sometimes controlled slave trade. There was another important slave market. In fact, um, parallel to uh, this uh, Arabic slave market, which I just described, there was a huge slave market uh, that was uh, controlled by Ottoman Empire, Ottoman Turks, Ottoman Turks. Okay, uh, Crimean Island, Crimean Island was the major source purchasing place where those who wanted to buy uh, didn't want to go long route or didn't have access to African slaves. They came here to the Crimean Peninsula, to so-called Kaffa. Kaffa today is a resort area called Theodosi in the present-day Russia. You know that in 2014, uh, a Russian president invaded this area and captured this area, Crimean Peninsula, took it away from Ukraine, so formally it belonged to Ukraine. But at that time, uh, the time we're talking about 15 1600s uh, this area was controlled by um, Crimean Tatars uh, Crimean Tatars Muslims um, they had their own kingdom here okay and a king a Tatar king was the vassal so dependent of a Turkish Sultan so basically it was dependent area, dependent on Ottoman Empire, because Ottoman Empire, you know, it was the biggest Muslim empire. So in this Crimean kingdom was also a Muslim kingdom, and this Crimean kingdom controlled the slave trade. Okay. In fact, um, oh, by the way, here you can see this, uh, the scene of uh, selling a slave, a Slavic slave, probably Ukrainian or Polish. A uh, girl that was brought uh, to be uh, sold by these um, Crimean uh, slave traders to be sold to Middle Eastern princes. Uh, <clears throat> okay, here is the um, some statistics. See this Crimean uh, kingdom, Crimean slave traders raided these areas. Russia, Ukraine, Poland, and captured slaves and brought them for sale to be delivered to Ottoman Empire and further to the Middle East. Okay, the same thing that had be, that was done in Africa, they were doing here in Eastern Europe. Okay, and three million people were sold. Again, it's a rough estimate. Three million people were sold by the Crimean slave traders, Crimean Kingdom, from fourteen hundreds to 1700s okay there was an, another minor slave market which i didn't mention but since it's here on these numbers it's so-called barbary slave trade so there was so-called bar 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 berber berber barbary see berber people it's berber arabic people who lived here were called berbers okay some of them were a mixture of africans and arabs uh, they became known as berbers but european called them barbary slave traders so they also practiced uh, slave trade. They seized Europeans, local Africans, and sold them. So the sale of Europeans and Africans was about 1.25 million people from 1500s to 1830s. 
in ancient series by the way united states interrupted the slave trade by um, defeating defeating this barbary slave states why because these uh, barbary states uh abducted a lot of europeans and um uh, and some american uh, navy decided to uh, intervene here to defeat the barbary kingdoms although as you know slave trade slave uh, trade and slave uh, slavery itself still existed in the united states for black people okay but the u.s navy interfered here uh, purposely to stop abducting of these uh, uh, american navy people because some american navy people were abducted and turned into slaves by uh, this mediterranean arabic kingdoms okay there was also a separate ottoman trade in slaves right here okay in south southeastern europe uh, bulgaria greece romania so here ottoman turks seized 2.5 million slaves 1400 1700 see there were a lot of uh, areas and i even don't talk about asia because we don't have time to talk uh, too much about asia at this point okay <clears throat> now let's talk about um, decline of the slave trade you might be interested to find out when everything started to decline as i told you uh, the first three european countries that started to question institution of slavery it was netherlands france and england in fact Netherlands was the first country to abolish slavery, but then under the influence of uh, Dutch slave merchants, it was repealed. Same thing happened in France as a result of French Revolution. We are going to discuss soon uh, for the French Revolution, 1789, 1789. As a result of this, France actually adopted the law to abolish slavery, but then it was reintroduced when napoleon came to power slavery was reintroduced because the owners of uh, sugarcane plantations pressured the government to roll back everything so to make a long story short it was only england england became the first country see this slide again the first country to make slavery illegal and they kind of kept this practice so they didn't roll back Slave trade was made illegal in Britain in 1807. In U.S. slave trade, not the slavery, by the way, the slave trade was made illegal 1808, France 1831, and Spain 1834. Okay, see, and once the slave trade became illegal, so prices for slaves went high because see, there was not enough slaves, especially when Britain sent boats boats to what to to confiscate um, british and american boats that still carried slaves from western africa to caribbean islands brazil okay so it was un unsafe for the slave traders to do this business so that is why quote unquote business so that is why um, prices for slaves uh, went very high in fact in parts of the united states um, since the slave trade was uh, abolished it was um, slaves were so expensive to perform some uh, sometimes to perform hard labor some slave holders uh, they preferred to hire irish labor because they didn't want to uh, damage uh, their human property so to speak quote unquote okay slaves were employed on cotton plantations as you know in southern united states or used as uh, um, as servants okay so the 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 prices for slaves went uh, very high okay look at these prices in uh, 1850s when the slave trade um, hardly existed in atlantic ocean okay 12 between 12 and 1400 dollars it's uh, 25,000 dollars in today's money again slavery was slowly 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 declining and i repeat the first 
nations who started to question this institution, the reason they questioned this institution was simply because uh, part of the European intellectuals, educated people, uh, they said that, oh, it was against the Bible, against religion. So all people are equal in the eyes of God. That is why we have to eliminate slavery. So that is why in England, for instance, there was a powerful um, Protestant movement against um, slavery. Okay. And in fact, Methodist Church, you heard about Methodist Church, part of the agenda of Methodist Church at that time in England was to fight against slavery and prominent Methodist ministers. They, in fact, worked to eliminate slavery. Uh, there was also a part of um, European um, writers, politicians, intellectuals who argued that slavery should be outlawed for economic reasons. Again, it was uh, an argument made on economic uh, grounds. Okay, Those who made this argument, they said slave labor is a very unprofitable, so nobody is going to work for free. Who is going to work for free? The productivity of slave labor is very, very meager. Okay, No reasonable human being is going to work for free under duress, the productivity, Enforced labor is a very, very unproductive. And it's true, by the way. It's a very, very true. Enforced labor is not productive. One of the people, one of the famous um, writers who made this point was uh, Adam Smith. Did you hear about Adam Smith? Adam Smith was a Scottish professor of moral philosophy. And uh, by the way, he wrote the famous book, which you may have heard of. It, uh, it is called The Wealth of Nations, which is published, by the way, in 1776. There's something interesting about this date, right? 1776. Uh, this book by uh, Adam Smith was published called uh, The Wealth of Nations. Um, professor of moral, moral Philosophy, this Professor of moral, moral Philosophy, Adam Smith, he argued that slave labor should be totally outlawed. When he was writing about North America, particularly in Brazil, um, North American southern states, uh, Brazil, northern part of Brazil, Caribbean islands, uh, they said, uh, look how unproductive this labor. What if we begin to pay? What if it's a paid labor? So it will be uh, more productive. And, uh, in fact, you might get a better profit from this. So he was uh, basically making an argument that uh, by relying on free labor, you will, ga you will gain in a long-term perspective. Okay? In a short-term perspective, you might not see it, but in a long-term perspective, the gain will be huge when you switch to the free labor. So on economic grounds, he... Uh, criticize uh, cri criticize slavery okay so these people like adam smith some christian theologians from methodist church they were in the forefront of fighting against slavery and that is why in england they um, abolished this first they abolished slave trade 1807 and then um, britain outlawed slavery in 1830 completely outlawed in the british empire and um, ending my uh, story about a slave trade all over the world with an emphasis on the transatlantic slave trade I want to bring you back and to show you this um, map which demonstrates the network of connections between the old world and the new world again I'm going to bring up to your attention so-called Columbian Exchange, the major, for better, for worse. Two parts of the world met each other and they became involved, in, involved into this exchange of good and bad things, doing good and bad things, okay? Um, trade 
connected these two parts of the world. Remember, in the in my introductory lecture, I made this point that what uh, made our world modern was the trade networks which connected the different parts of the world together. So that's what we see here. There were different uh, items exchanged among these areas. Okay. Lumber, furs rice, silk, tobacco, sugar, molasses, wood were coming from uh, South and North America. Manufactured goods were coming from Europe. Okay, guns, clothes, iron, beer were, were coming from Europe to Africa. Exchange for what? Gold, spices, hardwoods, slaves, unfortunately. Okay. Um, rum, liquor, iron, gunpowder, clothes, tools were brought to West Africa. Again, exchange for slaves. Slaves were brought here. Okay. Plus, there was also slave trade here. Some slaves that had been brought here were later sold to southern United States in 17, uh, especially in early 1700s. Okay. There was a small trade here between Caribbean islands and southern part of the United States when in the 1700s and this um, slave trade uh, intensified by the end of 1700s when the cotton uh, cotton was introduced in the south okay so that will be uh, the end of our uh, lecture about the transatlantic slave trade and um, I will we'll see you next time Thank you for your attention.